Ahmed. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're here today to talk about diversity in national security, so I'd be remiss if I didn't begin by saying happy pride. Hello. <laughs> this is a hugely important conversation, as I know you all know, and before I introduce our amazing panel, I want to set the stakes of what we're talking about and why we're talking about it now. President Joe Biden entered office recognizing that national security institutions were extremely demoralized and had long-standing issues with diversity. He issued a memo on, diverse, on revitalizing the national security workforce. He's mentioned diversity in the national security strategy. President Biden says it's time for the State Department to stop being failed, male, and Yale. He says DOD desegregated 75 years ago. Let's talk about extremism in the ranks. However, there's been some discontent, there's been pushback. In my own reporting, I had one political appointee, for instance, tell me, quote, we were simply political props in this administration. So what does it mean to have a genuine conversation about diversity? And then let's think about this externally. America's role in the world depends on being a coherent, multiracial democracy. Right now, we're not seeing that voice. We look at questions of Ukraine aid, uh, you saw today the news from Brazil, of Brazil pushing back yet again on Ukraine aid. How can America's diversity be used to advance its foreign policy priorities, explain why Washington is doing what it's doing, and have an actually effective strategy? So in our panel today, I'm hoping we can talk about what's the good work being done on diversity and national security and what needs to change. What does it mean to see historic firsts, like Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, the first black sec def, DNI Haynes, so many others in this administration, but what it means to go not just at that higher level, but at the levels below, to build the pipeline, to have meaningful access. Uh, I have an amazing panel today. We've got Dr. Nola Haynes, a Truman National Security Project Fellow, a professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. We've got the Honorable Gil Cisneros, the Undersecretary of Personnel and Management at the Defense Department. And we've got Dr. Alyssa Ayers, the Dean of George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Thank you all for being here with me today, and thank you all for being here for this conversation. I hope you're hydrated and caffeinated and ready to ask a lot of questions. Um, I definitely am. And I'll start with you, Undersecretary Cisneros, if we could, to get a bit of the administration perspective about the work you're doing at the Pentagon and beyond. We've seen uh, a lot of conversations about the woke military. It raises the question of whether the military was asleep. Um, but more importantly, what is this narrative and how are you in the Pentagon entering it, responding to it, and saying actually diversity is a strength for the fighting force? Well, I, you know, as um, so there are two things, right? So I serve as the personnel, uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel Readiness, and also the Chief Diversity an inclusion officer for the Department of Defense. And, you know, there are a lot of people that are pushing that narrative. I refuse to use that word. Uh, but to me, I just ignore it. We push forward. Uh, we, diversity uh, at the Department of Defense, we see it as a strength. We know inclusion is important. Um, we are integrating and, and making our forces more diverse. We see that it's something that's necessary. Uh, when it comes to, like you said, talked about the president's executive orders, right? Um, we've taken it to, to different levels and we've gone out and done more, I think, than has ever been done before from this department. Um, not only are we trying to put a focus on uh, what we're doing with, with inside the department, but also how are we interacting with communities outside of our installations? Um, you know, I kind of refer to it as our good neighbor policy, right? Making sure that we are supporting women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Uh, we, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense has been uh, wonderful at, at putting a, an emphasis on making sure that we are, um, you know, that when he d looks at the promotions for our general and, and admirals, uh, they're not coming to him with just names. They're coming to him with a, a diverse slate of candidates. Um, and he's done a good job of promoting those individuals. 
there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, don't uh, get me wrong there. Uh, we still have a lot of things to do. Uh, we still need to do a, a better job at growing our bench, uh, making sure that we are putting an emphasis in um, making sure that we're getting people in the right career fields so that can be part of that bench kind of moving forward and can eventually become those senior executives, whether they're in the civilian field or are becoming more of those um, our GOFOs, our general officers and flag officers. But um, diversity is a strength and we will keep pr pursuing that avenue. Uh, it has done wonders in the business community and we know it's gonna do wonders for us as well. And can I ask what barometers the administration is using to measure itself, right? So we've seen some criticism come out. There was a CNN report recently suggesting that you know, fear of wokeism had forced the Pentagon to change its approach to combating extremism. Um, there's been a Pentagon IG report saying the Congressional Commission on Diversity at, at the Pentagon just had only implemented six of its 18 recommendations. Where does the administration think it stands? I mean, do you think there's justified criticism? We've seen it even from folks in the Truman community. Um, Christopher Goldsmith, who's on our next panel, said, quote, the Pentagon's been completely ineffective on extremism, and it's no different from two years ago. So how do you respond to the, the, those criticisms, that scrutiny? You know, I, I read that CNN article, and when I, my, I first read it, I thought this is completely false, because it's not true. We are going out, and we are combating extremism. We have put out a, a, a DOTI on, on combating extremism that talks about uh, extremist groups as well as gang activities. Uh, we've, we've changed the forms that we use. Uh, we're working closer with law enforcement to ensure that when somebody comes in, what tattoos do they have that may be forms of, of gan gang or, or extremist groups. Um, so we are, we are doing more. And again, there's still more to be done uh, that needs to be done, and, and we're, we're doing that. Our, and our, our intelligence and, uh, and, and security uh, component, our INS, is, is working hard to make sure that they're updating things. But... Um, you know, that, that article kind of gave the impression that we were just sitting on hands, that we're not doing anything, and nothing would be further from the truth. We have an extremist group task force that, that just met recently, um, and they're going to continue to meet. Thank you, and I'd, I'd love to get into that a bit more in our, in our discussion, but I'll move on you know, with the pointed questions to you, Dr. Haynes, um, who is flown in from sunny California, where everyone, as you can tell, dresses so much better than all of us <laughs> here. Uh, so she's here to shame us and educate us. Um, <laughs> Dr. Haynes, what I love about your perspective as a national security practitioner is that you're beyond the beltway, right? And I know Truman has a big focus on talking about how that's a big contribution. So can you talk about how you bring that in into your work and also just how DC narratives hit different in other places, right? I'm thinking about China being a huge trading partner for California. How does DC's hawkishness translate there? Or if you're talking to communities that have been historically underserved, let's talk about people of color in this country and you're saying we're sending billions in aid abroad. How do you explain that? How do you, you know, connect that way? I'm gonna start with the first of those four questions. <laughs> <laughs> and so yes, um, California is a very interesting space because we have a lot of national security structure there. We have the academic institutions, we have labs, we have think tanks, we have an infrastructure. And unfortunately, a lot of people, especially from communities of color, and this is something I care a great deal about, are not plugged into um, that, that structure. And that's something that I'm a huge advocate of because I think there's so many exciting careers inside of national security and foreign policy, and people just don't know about them. So that, that's one part of it. And one of the things that's really important from a West Coast perspective is obviously climate security. And not just climate security in the way that California is innovating in uh, clean energy, tech, um, a, uh, quantum AI, but in ter terms of foreign, foreign policy, when you think about the smaller Pacific Island states um, who are really suffering from climate insecurities. And then we also think about the relationship with China. And then we also think about the relationship with Taiwan. So we have a whole security system that is on the Pacific coast that sometimes we feel like we're not being heard as much because we're not in the beltway. And like I said, you know, there are communities like Pacific Council, there's RAND, 
nothing compared to all the think tanks <laughs> here in DC, but we are doing very important work. And from my perspective, as an academic who works on uh, traditional and emerging threats, one of the things that's really important to me is, say for instance, with China. While we are definitely in um, a tense situation with China, one thing that's important to me is a lot of my colleagues who may be of Chinese descent, I want to make sure that they feel safe too, that they aren't being seen in a negative light, which tends to happen historically mm -hmm. when we think about what happened after 9-11, when we think about what happened with all the Arab and Muslim communities. And in our country, unfortunately, we have of, you know, that, that kind of um, branding people because of their identities. So it's a very complicated uh, nexus of security. We have human security, we have climate security, we have foreign policy. So it's this beautiful kind of um, nexus of uh, security concerns that I bring with me from beautiful sunny California. <laughs> um, Dean, I'll ask you from the academic perspective, um, how you think scholars and scholar practitioners, I know you've previously served in the State Department, are adapting to have a more diverse, more inclusive conversation, and, and kind of what you're hearing from your students. Um, I know, you know the undersecretary is a GW alum as well. What you're hearing, what they want, where they want to go, and if you have specifics, that would be great, you know, whether it's on curricula, subnational diplomacy, any of that that Elliot is working on. Thank you. Well, we had spoken earlier and I made sure to bring some specific examples because I wanted to do full justice to the question. Um, first, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and be part of this panel and, and to bring a kind of uh, perspective of how we think about educating our rising leaders who will go out and be employed in many different components of the international affairs space. I do want to echo what Jenna Ben Yehuda led with in her opening remarks, that we at the Elliott School see the question of national security in the same way as the Truman Center. We are a school of international affairs. We have six disciplines represented among our faculty and then some. So we're not specifically and only focused on international relations, we also have comparative politics, we have history, we have economics, we have geography, we have anthropology, we have public policy. So uh, this is a pretty broad look at what it means to do the practice of international affairs. There's kind of three ways of thinking about curriculum and, and what you can bring to questions of curriculum and diversity. And, and we certainly think diversity is an important component of this. At the, the level of our, our faculty, faculty develop their individual syllabi. And I can say certainly our faculty have been seized with the question of uh, responding to the great changes that are taking place in the world and making sure that the individual courses they're offering are, are creating different opportunities for perspectives and viewpoints for our students in the classes. So just to give you a few examples, um, uh, our faculty are, are bringing in new and diverse readings and guest speakers in courses focused on the Middle East. Of course, uh, with the pandemic and a routinization of virtual engagement, it's really much easier to bring in a guest speaker for your class, provided that you get the time zone aligned. It was a lot harder. 15 years ago when you would have had to bring somebody in. Um, we've got faculty who are intentionally adding voices and perspectives from minorities in China for courses that are focused on East Asia. Faculty who are including work on disability rights in what they're teaching. Faculty who uh, have courses on democratic erosion, including uh, a section on race and democracy. Um, questions of the ethics of foreign assistance and including in that course consideration of race and gender and geopolitical hierarchies. Or, or scholars who are working on nationalisms who include a focus on nationalism and race. Like, I could go on and on, but I think that gives you a sense of disciplinary diversity in the way that many of our faculty are saying, hey, there are, we need a broadening of perspectives to equip our students to be uh, great practitioners in the world that they're graduating into. Um, I also wanted to note that, that it, when we think about curriculum at the level of a program, at the level of a degree, we're always thinking about what goes into the component courses that go into a degree program. Every five years or so, we take a look and revise what we're doing. Um, last year, I asked a group of our uh, wonderful faculty from across ten different disciplines uh, to convene as a special committee on the curriculum and develop some thoughts on what we would include if we were developing an international affairs curriculum not building on what we already had, but kind of blue sky thinking for the 21st century. 
and they uh, put together a really thoughtful report. I won't go into all the details, um, but three of the important elements of their findings were that the world today is marked by having to think really closely about the question of being U.S. focused versus internationally focused, having to think about diversity in, in all of its facets, and having to think about the interconnections around the world, and, and thinking about the ways that we have those principles percolate out throughout our different degree programs. So that's kind of high level. Um, the third thing I wanted to just make sure to raise, and we could come back to this in more detail, is that there really is a great democratization taking place when we think about foreign policy in the world. It's, foreign policy is not the purview of you know, the, the striped pants set or whatever, right? Some perspective of a, a very narrow group. It actually affects all of us. And, I think that became very, very clear in a kind of uh, everyday newspaper, coffee table, breakfast way with the pandemic, because we saw how something that happens in one place affects the entire world very rapidly. We saw the knock-on effects with supply chain, economic security. Um, with, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we saw the use of economic sanctions as an important leading edge tool in foreign policy and what that does right. for things around for our economic security. So with those examples we see now how states, counties, cities have important stakes in foreign policy and national security and we are now thinking active, we're actively brainstorming as a school about how we can be responsive to that question and be happy to go into more detail but one of the things we're thinking about is how we can develop a credential, not a full degree program, uh, but maybe something that gives people who are becoming international affairs practitioners access to some training uh, that speaks to what they're doing at the state or county or city level, because this is where we're seeing the great expansion of international affairs engagement. So there's a few examples, but happy to go into more. Well, I, I love that because I think I love that because I think it it links to something coming up from all of you, which is there's clearly a perception and and a reality, right, of exclusion from this national security and foreign policy conversation. And I wondered if as a group we could talk a bit about what the barriers to entry that remain are to having that truly inclusive space. So right, so whether it's talking about elevating the subnational level, talking about engaging with communities around military installations so that they feel a buy-in, right? Like what does it mean to have this giant American base and what are these people gonna do abroad? Um, talking about just places outside the Beltway and communities that have not been thinking about this. How are you all thinking about, you know, three to five years, what are the top things you think need to be addressed to have that more genuine, diverse conversation? In our pre, you know, prep talks, some interesting stuff came up around just basic things, right? Things that we, that are not highfalutin, that are not in textbooks, but things that are as basic as, do you know anyone in Washington, D.C.? Do you have the money to travel here, right? What, and you come here, can you get a security clearance to get a job, right? What does that mean? I'm an immigrant. You know, if you're someone with foreign contacts, with family abroad, with, you know, a mold that's different. So how are you all thinking from your different vantage points? And I'll let any of you take this on. Um, you can kind of build on it. I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. So during COVID, we had this opportunity to f fellowship and meet with people that we would have never been able to in person because you were able to congregate together from people from many different walks of life, many different agencies. And so I was part of a national security kind of collective with a lot of uh, people of color. Mm. And one of the things that my friends in the international, uh, I mean, in the intelligence community would constantly say is the barrier to entry around security clearances. and. That is a very intense process. It can be a stressful, anxiety type of process. And one of the things that a lot of the males brought up was this idea that what if you made a mistake when you were younger and that mistake follows you? And depending on which um, agency you enter, there is a lie detector component to it. And that really stokes fear in people that they maybe don't pass it, not because they've done something nefarious, it's just this kind of relationship, this tension that exists. So the security clearance issue, 
um, is a is a really big barrier to entry from certain from from people from certain communities of color. And I don't know what the answer is, but I will say it is a conversation that's being had, especially in the intelligence community. And you know, I've I've I've, I've lived my life in a very particular way, and I got to tell you. That's a stressful process, you know? And, um, and so w w when people find out, depending on what you do in this space, that you have to go through that process, they may not be as attracted to, to do the work. So it, 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 it's, it's a very interesting relationship with the security part of it all. Um, and so like I said, I, I don't have any uh, answers to it, but it's a, it's a conversation that's being had. I will say at the Department of Defense, and, and this is, again, I think, I think we got to do better, right? Mm -hmm. we got to do a better job of educating people what opportunities, you know, the Department of Defense, the U.S. military can provide. Um, I was 18 years old. I joined the United States Navy because I knew I wanted to do something. I just wasn't really sure what. Um, and the opportunity that it gave me really changed my life. Um, you know, I have three degrees, all because of my military service. Um, it, it, it really created uh, an opportunity to go out there and to do something different. Uh, and we got to do a better job at telling that type of story. Uh, we have a, a lot of individuals out there who have joined the military and really have, have prospered like I did. And it prevented them, or I mean not prevented them, but it gave them an opportunity to go into this national security space where they could do things and really kind of improve their lives. And uh, we got to do a better job at communicating that message into communities of color, underserved communities, because uh, you know a lot of them think when I talk to young kids and I talk to a young man who's a, you know the son of a good friend of mine, um, well hey you know you should did you ever think about joining the military and he's ah you know I I just I don't want to get hurt mm -hmm. you know everybody thinks you're joining we're going to hand you an M16 and that's going to be you know what we're going to have you do but there are so many things that you can do within the military around intelligence um, you know cyber security and, and space and uh, you know languages and, and all these fields that are so important to the mission that we have and we need uh, diverse people in these fields like our undersecretary uh, Ron Moultrie who's um, he's undersecretary of, of INS intelligence and security you know, he wants those bilingual individuals because, you know, his thing is we already know two, we can teach you another one. It makes it a lot easier because you already understand languages. So we've got to do a better job and we're working on that to communicate the messages of what benefits the military can give, to give people in, to bring them in through the military into national security. Higher ed perspective? Uh, certainly, I, I think it would be not news to anyone here that one of the big barriers to access in higher ed is tuition. Um, for our undergraduates, the George Washington University has made a very significant commitment. We are on a pathway to be able to full need to all Pell eligible students, uh, I believe by 2027, so we're phasing that in, but it's a very significant financial commitment from the university. Um, we are actively actively uh, raising funds to provide endowed scholarships for our undergraduates. Um, we are always raising funds to, to provide additional fellowship support for our graduate students so we can help make that amazing education available to more people. That certainly is a high priority. Um, another area that is always a challenge and one that's really important for us and we do focus a lot about on this um, is helping students have access to the networks that will shape their opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we pride ourselves in the fact that we help our students land great internships, undergraduates as well as graduate students. Those internships can be the pathway to a job opportunity. They can also importantly be the pathway to identifying something that somebody doesn't want to do. So they can find that next direction. Um, but we care a lot about that. We began raising funds uh, about a year ago for an Elliott Equity Fund uh, to be supportive of opportunities for students. So not only on a tuition basis, but on a non-tuition basis. If there are internships that aren't unpaid, can we help fill the gap? So somebody doesn't ha be put in a position of having to forego an important career shaping opportunity because of need. So those are a few examples, but certainly we, we care a lot about access to the education. We'll continue to keep working on that and to providing those pathways for the networking opportunities that will be so important for all of our students. Thank you. 
I, so we're talking, we've talked a bit about getting into that national security space, and I wondered if we could shift then to questions of retention. Like, where along the pipeline are people, especially people from historically marginalized groups, dropping out, just saying, you know, I am a square peg in a round hole. This institution was not built for me or people who look like me. And where, where can we be doing a better job? You know, in my own reporting, I found that at the State Department, for instance, there's still huge issues with reporting um, mistreatment, harassment. A recent survey at the State Department found that 44% of State Department employees had experienced discrimination, harassment, and bullying, and most of them had not reported it because they felt nothing's going to happen. So I, I wonder how you're thinking about retention and in your own experiences where you've seen people say, you know what, I'm trying, I've been given the opportunities, I know I come from a historically marginalized place, I have a different perspective, but it's just too much. You know, 10 years, 15 years in, I don't see a future for myself, promotions are going to be hard. Um, how, how are you thinking about keeping people in the space and elevating them? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say right now, uh, retention of the United States military is at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. You know, I think once we get people in there, uh, they know the, the job that they're doing, what the mission's all about. Um, they want to stay. Um, you know, we are working hard to ensure that we are taking care of our people. Uh, that is something that Secretary Austin has put a tremendous focus on. And we are working to ensure that we're not only taking care of our service members, but their families as well. And we'll continue to do that because we know it's important, right? There is a saying in the military is, um, you know, you recruit the individual, but you retain the family. And so that's something that we will, uh, again, we're going to continue to work on that and, and focus on that. Uh, you know, around our, our civilian employees that we have, um, you know, I, I think it is about kind of bringing in, we want talent at the Department of Defense. I want people to think of us as an employer of choice. Um, and I know uh, going to USA Jobs and applying for some of those jobs can be tedious and <laughs> it can take a long time. And we're, we're working with uh, OPM to kind of uh, see how we can streamline that process and make it better and get the, the security check, you know, done a little bit faster than uh, it's been done in the, in the past. But, um, you know, we want to bring in, right, and we want to give you people opportunity. And I think that's what it's really about is giving you an opportunity to get in there and succeed and show us what you can do. Um, you know, and I think when that happens, and, and we've had a number of individuals that do that have gone on to move to, to other things and take higher positions uh, that have been people of color, that have been women. Uh, and so we want to bring new people in to do that and continue to do that. And I think that's something that I take very seriously. And I know uh, the other people of the, that I work with at the department is, is how can we nurture those under us and kind of raise them up so that they can go on and do other things. I, I would like to jump in here. Yeah. This is a very important question because we get to talk about that word that's becoming, that term that's becoming a little dirty, D-E-I-A. And <laughs> ooh, big scary term. But what's important to remember in higher education also, and then also in a lot of the different agencies, the diversity part, the recruitment part is only one part of it. The representation part is one part of it. What does the inclusivity part look like? What does the equity part look like? Is that culture open to change? And that's what we're talking about here, right? So Talking to a lot of cops. Thank you. <laughs> talking to a lot of colleagues from higher education to state defense, whatever, I see this has been the constant theme. It's about culture. It's in, and, and I think that some of the policies that say we're diversity, 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 some people who have already traditionally been in these spaces feel like it's being forced upon them. And I think that's something to keep in mind and to consider. And then other folks who look like me, who are in some of these spaces and positions, we feel like we're the show pony, right? Mm -hmm. And so what do you do to try and bridge that gap? How do you do that? And that's where the answer lies. It's somewhere in the middle of the representation and the traditional cultures, and what, and what do we do to bridge that? And I'm a big, big, big believer in inc inclusivity. I think that once we understand that a lot of this works better if we're all engaged in the National Security Project, if all of the agencies 
all of the higher ed um, institutions actually looked like the country, looked like the rest of the world, I think that we are in a far stronger position, right? So I really do believe in DEIA and not just because it's about quotas or anything like that, no. It's important because it's gonna take all of us to get the job done. It's gonna take all of us to make sure that we maintain this democracy that really is on the brink. And so all of these different things matter. And inclusivity, I cannot say it enough, and equity is how we get there. And to your point, I'll, ju I'll just quote from the National Security Strategy where they say, quote, we are prioritizing DEIA, they use you know, the scary term, <laughs> to ensure national security institutions reflect the American public that they represent. Mm -hmm. And I loved your point about the resistance to change and how we, we call that what it is and acknowledge that it exists because these moments have existed before, right? There, there have been efforts at greater diversity in the national security establishment dating back to the 50s. It was a Cold War imperative, then it was a Kennedy imperative, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen this happen and then we've seen people inside the bureaucracy say, no way to stop and often these are people with positions of power. So I'm wondering if we can talk about why this moment is different and maybe connect that all to just everyone's personal experiences in this national security space. Like, we are sitting here on a stage where we are not Bale, Mail, and Yale. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Where, where, how have you all navigated this space and do you think this is a really different moment for diversity and national security than the conversations we've had before that clearly did not fully deliver? I can go first on this yeah. one. Um, you know, at the Department of Defense, I, I think it's, it's, we've known that DEIA is, is very important and it's something that needs to be integrated into the national defense strategy, mm -hmm. and it is. Mm -hmm. um, and it, we are trying to change the culture there and working around it. And the thing that we're doing, right, is that um, w when we started uh, our 2040 task force, um, we've made DEIA not just a personnel readiness problem, but it is a, or well, I shouldn't say a problem, but we've made DEIA a Department of Defense issue that's something that the whole entire department needs to play a role in, in changing the culture and ensuring that we are providing that, that diversity and that equity and inclusion to all the personnel that are there to, to create that opportunity uh, that guy like myself had. Um, and, and really that is the change that we have gone and what we've done differently and what we've been able to do and I think President Biden has gone and, and supported it and with his executive orders. And this is something that I will say too, it, it, it didn't just start with President Biden. The last administration, uh, you know, Secretary Esper actually did a study and started moving towards doing some of these uh, DEIA initiatives because he knew how important it was. They saw the research and, and shown how important it was and how diverse teams drive better results. There is a a Marine Corps study that the study the Marine Corps did that said when teams are integrated with at least one woman, that they perform better than, you know, and if it's just all male. Um, and so this is why we've seen it and why we've kind of taken this initiative to say like, okay, we're not doing diversity for diversity's sake. We're not doing inclusion for inclusion's sake. It's gotta be an integral part of our strategy and it's gonna make us better. And we know diverse teams are better teams. And, it's, and that's what's driving us, you know, going towards the future. And I love that you mentioned this is a bipartisan priority. You know, this has been historically, it has not just been a Democratic-led mm -hmm. issue. But Dina, I'll bring you in. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on that and, and just to say first, um, I, I want to give great credit to my predecessor at the Elliott School, Ambassador Ruben Brigady, who uh, came into the role in 2015 and, and really established uh, what I think is a, a wonderful and leading edge program focused on the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the way we think about an international affairs education. We have an assistant dean position, uh, an assistant dean for student services, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, I think she is here today, Dr. Lakeisha Harrison. There she is, thank you. Um, so please feel free to introduce yourselves to Dr. Harrison if you have a chance. Um, but this, this illustrates the priority that we place on the DEI mission for a higher education institution. Um, I'd also say that what is as important at the same time, as our country becomes more and more diverse, 
the world and the shifting, the world is becoming more multipolar. So we need to prepare our students for a world in which they have to know a lot about a lot of things to be fluent in an international affairs career and in an international affairs practitioner arena. And I wonder if we can, on, on that point, about just the world changing, American influence shifting, right, and America's approach vis-a-vis -vis other, other nations just needing to be maybe a little less dominant or a little more inclusive, cooperative. How you see the, a more diverse national security establishment for the U.S. empowering the U.S. as an actor on the world stage, right? What does it mean when you go talk to India and Brazil and try to get them to support Ukraine, right? Or when you're talking about migration in Europe in a way that's, yes, you know, control the issue, but also humane and actually standing by these ideals. How are you all seeing that or have you seen that, you know, in dealing with foreign interlocutors, in dealing in the policy making conversation? Where the, where does that kind of resonate and impact all of it? Um, one of my, my mentors, Under Secretary uh, Bonnie Jenkins at Department of State, when she goes out into the world and she's representing the United States and, so when, she, and when she's talking about very important issues around arms control, treaties, things that keep us safe and our allies and partner countries safe, it's America keeping its promise. It's America saying, we're not just saying that diversity is, our, um, is a strength. We're showing up and you know, we actually mean it. So in, in, in that's, that's just one example. But where we are now having to regain our, um, our international credit, so to speak, diversity factors because our allies and our enemies are watching, right? So they're seeing what happens um, after George Floyd. They're seeing what's happening with the uh, mass shootings. They're seeing what's happening with our extreme political polarization, right? And they're seeing, um, I, 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 I talked to a few international friends recently, and there's, there's a really crash joke about, oh, you haven't gotten shot yet as a black person. And you have to stop and think, this is, this is the perception. This is an international perception of America. And what we have to do better is to make sure that we are standing behind DEIA, right? Because you cannot show up to these spaces at the negotiating table, uh, male, stale, and pale. I went to Harvard, so that's, <laughs> I just want to go ahead and put that out there. I didn't go to Yale. Um, so, but, but that matters, right? It matters who shows up to the negotiating table. And in my line of work, I see the change. I wouldn't be in the room you know, if, if it weren't for this administration standing behind DEIA in a very real way. And we have to continue that. We have to continue the commitment to DEIA. Tina, as in your experience, you know, just previously at the State Department, I wonder if this came up at all in, with dealing with your interlocutors and, and their curiosity or, you know, how you were able to explain America as a force that maybe wasn't like what they expected. the privilege of, is, I haven't touched it, <laughs> didn't do anything. Um, I, I had the privilege of serving in the State Department as a Council on Foreign Relations fellow in 2007 and 2008. So as a nonpartisan fellow under the leadership of uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Mm -hmm. And then I returned to the State Department um, to serve in the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs under the leadership of Secretary Hillary Clinton. Um, so for me, the State Department was a place that had strong women as leaders setting our foreign policy direction and speaking to the world uh, about who we were as Americans with a very strong emphasis on gender equality. Um, I, I will also say, when, when you sent us this question in advance, I, I wanted to be sure to say that I have really benefited in my career from wonderful mentors who were men, mm -hmm. who invested in helping me advanced to different stages in my career and saw something in me and encouraged me to go for opportunities, maybe even if I thought at the time I wasn't ready. Um, so I, I did want to say that because I we've had State Department leadership that has presented uh, a diverse view of the United States on the world stage and brought that uh, to newspapers and television screens and phones all around the world. And I think that's been very beneficial for us as a country. 
and I love that point. I think that, that, that that's something that gets missed. It's often you know, the people who are maybe traditionally in the positions of power, but are also aware that, as, as you were saying, under Secretary Cisneros, this makes better policy, mm -hmm. right? Like, I want to bring in a different, more diverse group. Um, I know we are wrapping up in a little bit just for q and A. I I wanted to, to highlight a couple of things for the Q&A and invite you all if there was anything you wanted to say before we get into that. Just a few things uh, of diversity in national security is actually measurable, right? We can actually look at what is happening and where people are in the hierarchy and where they're moving up. So I'd encourage folks who are interested in this, there's a great group, group called Inclusive America that does really good tracking on this. LC Wins is another one. Um, and the administration has created these agency equity teams. So as we look at the US's future on this issue and potentially where this goes with another administration that's less friendly, it's important to see what progress has been made here. Um, I'll give you all just a quick, if there's anything you want to just say before Q&A. Yeah. I do have something, otherwise I maybe talked a little bit too much, but I didn't get to something that I do think is important, and that's at developing strong pipeline programs. Um, and, and we do care a lot about this at the Elliott School since 2018. We've been convening a public service weekend in collaboration with uh, the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration at GW. Um, this year we're adding a third collaborator, GW Law, so the public service law component. We do that with PPIA, and it's designed to, to give people uh, an introduction to what careers in public service, whether uh, international affairs or more domestic public service, might look like. They can test drive that, that do a policy memo, see what that might be like. Um, we have some active uh, partnerships. Our, our uh, research institute focused on Asia has had an active partnership with Spelman College, again, focused on Asia and thinking about and learning about Asia, history, politics, and culture. Um, our Institute for Middle East Studies has created a partnership with Howard University focused on um, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so we're always thinking about this. We're about to do, um, one of our faculty members has a terrific project underway called the Generations Dialogue. This is Professor Jennifer Brinkerhoff, who just co-authored a book um, in collaboration with Aaron Williams, the first, uh, the first black director of the Peace Corps, uh, and Taylor Jack, an international development leader. Um, and the, the, the book is called The Young Black Leader's Guide to S S Careers in International Affairs, What the Giants Want You to Know. Mm. And so it's lessons and thoughts from giants who have succeeded in the field uh, in a book form so people can and pick this up and learn from, from their past successes. Uh, so Professor Brinkerhoff uh, has received a wonderful grant to convene students who might be interested in international affairs space to learn from the giants. And that's an example of a, a kind of pipeline program that helps give young people thinking about careers in international affairs a chance to learn about um, successes, tips that might be helpful to their own careers, um, and to ways of envisioning themselves in those roles down the line. Those are amazing resources. Thank you for sharing those. Maybe I'll drop in and do a little State Department memo. You are most welcome. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to invite our mic runners to kind of pass it out for Q&A if we have anyone. Um, yeah, I think we have a question. Hi, thank you. Good morning. My name is Cindy Serrano Roberts, and this question is directed to Under Secretary Cisnero. So, sir, I had an opportunity while I was on, a, on active duty to work with SAFDI, and I was a part of the barrier analysis working groups, and so I led several efforts to combat uh, barriers that stand in the way from airmen and their families from really becoming their full self. And so since retiring, I've had the opportunity to work with the United Nations, um, and last fall, the, U the UN Human Rights Council held a session on CERD, or the Commission on the Eradication of Discrimination in 